Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, folks, for letting us share with you some of the things that we've learned uh, over a number of years and, and density management. And uh, what I'm going to share with you today uh, is uh, some thoughts about how we can manage over the long run to achieve a long-term objective of maintaining the Douglas fir forest type while accomplishing a lot of other things. Uh, I'll start off with uh, some caveats. Uh, we're going to talk about findings from extended studies that have evaluated thinning of, in a variety of ways, different levels of thinning with and without gaps, underplanting, and that sort of thing, uh, with vegetation control in the understory. Uh, with the idea that uh, what we do right now is less important than what we actually get in the long run. And so what we're trying to do is work backwards from objectives with uh, uh, many, many combinations and permutations of silvicultural practices uh, to get there. And we're making the assumption that perpetuation of shade intolerant species uh, dominated by Douglas fir uh, is a goal and that the managers will have all the tools that their neighbors on private lands uh, enjoy at the present time. Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about, first of all, how our ob observations on how overstory density uh, defines energy level uh, that gets into the understory to power the undergrowth. Then how that overstory density uh, reduction uh, starts succession below. So we have succession in the overstory and some succession in the understory and uh, how we may have managed pieces of that. And then the temporary, temporary nature of the thinning effect and what that means in the repetition of entries and uh, the effect of those on what we've begun. And then we'll talk about some practices that federal agencies are not now able to use, but which have some very interesting consequences in understory vegetation control uh, to promote diverse herb communities and conifers in an understory that might otherwise be occupied by a shrub dominant system. And finally, uh, we'll look at a, at a different set of plans, maybe that uh, you're more familiar with from history and how to maintain a Douglas fir forest uh, enhanced by even age management. We've already heard that, uh, that these, these forests are, are very active. Things change from one decade to the next. And so what we really need to do is say where we need to be in the long term and maintaining Douglas fir means you have to establish Douglas fir and then you have to keep it in the stand without losing it until it becomes one of Rob's old growth stands that has Douglas fir still in it. It doesn't have to all be Douglas fir, but it has to be there. 80% of this region was dominated by Douglas fir at one time or another. And that's why it's called the Douglas fir region. So this I consider to be a goal in the part of the region that is considered Douglas fir type. So we'll be talking first about partial cutting and mid rotation, starting with 50 year old trees, uh, to lead to an increase in undergrowth uh, vegetation uh, with increased light. And we'll talk about what happens with several levels of leaf tree retention expressed as ground cover, uh, with the idea that as crowns grow, light drops and uh, we're looking at a rough threshold for Douglas fir understory that we might have planted there or natural regeneration following the thinning. Uh, when the crown cover goes above about 50 percent, maybe a little below, maybe a little above, depends on the site, uh, you lose the Douglas fir or at least it loses its momentum, its ability to compete. So we're looking here at uh, a view of stands that we, we thinned at age 50, uh, four different levels of residual stocking based on these four curves. Each one of those curves uh, 
has a subset of gappy and, and not gappy uh, with a quarter and sixth acre uh, little circular clear cuts. On a site that's really quite productive, it's a high site three on the average uh, that has between 50 and 100 years of age uh, adds uh, 20 to 25 cubic meters per hectare per year. Uh, in the understory here, we planted Douglas fir, Grand fir, Western hemlock, and Western red cedar to see uh, how an assortment of shade tolerant species uh, uh, can survive the, uh, the course of uh, years of crown development. Uh, as you can see with these curves here, uh, we started off with thin stands. The stands were only at about 45% crown cover when we entered, and we thinned to various levels, ranging from about 23% with our lowest density stands to uh, about 37% crown cover and our highest density stands. Our highest density stands uh, were at about 55% basal area stocking, according to a full stock Douglas fir stand, and the lowest was about 30% of the basal area, or 75 square feet per acre, uh, uh, at age 50. So we had relatively few trees per acre. And you'll notice that the two intermediate levels of thinning that we had here, uh, five years after the, these curves began, uh, they take a sudden break and drop there. We did a rethinning because already we were beginning to lose our Douglas fir, in fact, had lost it with our highest residual stand densities. And our lowest, we didn't rethin because the Douglas fir still seemed to be doing reasonably well, along with the other species that we planted. So when the stands get older, uh, we're looking now at the highest density. It's uh, about 100, 180 trees per hectare or 70 trees, which is uh, low by most of thinning standards. Uh, this would have been thinned to a level that, according to uh, sociologists here, uh, is unacceptable. And yet this is a stand that is dense enough so that it has pretty well terminated most of the underplanted trees, or if not terminated, relegated them to a very poor, poor level of, of vigor. Uh, this is a, a, what happens when we put gaps in the stand. Uh, we're looking at all the underplanted species uh, doing reasonably well, but not nearly as well as they do in clear cuts. Uh, we get some Douglas fir natural regeneration in this situation, and in this particular gap that I have viewed here is where the understory got sprayed before it was uh, thinned. So the perennial species were pretty well taken out of there before thinning. So the succession following thinning was wide open. There weren't so many ferns. And uh, so we picked up an awful lot of uh, biodiversity in the herb layer there. <clears throat> uh, this is a contrasting uh, gap where vegetation management uh, was not done before thinning. All of the sprouting species that got pretty well truncated by the thinning operation, all sprouted, and wound up with, uh, in many of these gaps, uh, shrub-dominant communities in which uh, you can see there's a Douglas fir right over there. It is uh, looking rather poorly and doesn't have a very uh, happy future. Uh, the vegetation management that we did uh, provided really quite striking and long-term patterns in the understory. Uh, the spray line came right, at, right down here. Uh, on the right side is the unsprayed, the left side is the sprayed, and uh, the understory seedlings uh, are not doing very well here, but they're doing well enough so that uh, we're going to have at least the shade tolerant species still reasonably well represented, uh, at least for a while longer. Over here, uh, the uh, understory uh, was mostly dominated by ferns and uh, sprouting shrubs and uh, the prospect for planted seedlings of any kind were significantly uh, decreased. Uh, here is uh, 
another thing that happened that was uh, really remarkable, and that is that even though uh, a lot of the big leaf maple uh, it, were, were not removed here, what happened is we had a fair number of volunteer big leaf maple, and we wind up with a shade tolerant understory of hardwoods rather than conifers uh, filling in underneath this uh, thin, moderately high density uh, residual stand. So these little guys uh, that show up uh, not very conspicuously uh, over the long run become more and more conspicuous. And uh, this photo was not taken in our, in our uh, experimental stands, but you see uh, here maybe 50 years later, uh, there is a stand of dominant Douglas fir, but the understory is primarily occupied by shade tolerant hardwoods, uh, maple in this case, but in southwestern Oregon it might be chinkapin, tan oak, madrone, any one of a variety of species that is quite capable of taking up a great deal of space. And you have, you'll have a few shade tolerant hardwoods, but there is zippo for Douglas fir in this understory. They're gone. Uh, so just sort of to summarize here, uh, this is uh, 15 years after our thinning and underplanting and vegetation control. Uh, this is the combination that seems to have the most future uh, right now. Uh, all of the planted species are still present. The Douglas fir still has a little bit of vigor. It's uh, declining rapidly. It turns out that what started off at 75 square feet of basal area is now 115 square feet of basal area, and the canopies have closed uh, to less than 50%. Douglas fir vigor is declining, but it's still a part of the sample. Uh, the, other, the shade tolerant understories are, are doing better. So uh, this is without gaps. With gaps, it's a little different. We have these clusters of larger trees. So this, uh, this stage, uh, we're wondering where it's going to go. If we hold this, there are several things that are going to have to do, be done. Uh, we'll have to rethin. We've tried that, and the rethinning does what? Well, it takes out some trees. It increases the, uh, uh, the uh, amount of daylight getting into the swamp. But it also takes out some of the trees that we've provided. So uh, among our underplanted trees, uh, we lost completely about 20% of them, and uh, we hammered up another 20%. So only about 60% of the stand, of the stand underplanted trees that were there at the time of thinning uh, came through the thinning. And we reinitiated a bunch of uh, understory uh, vegetation at that point. Uh, there are Rethinnings that need to be done. If you're going to hold a shade intolerant uh, community in that understory, you're going to have to rethin many times. And uh, you're going to lose some of the structure every time. And uh, so this is a high risk proposition unless you cut the residual stands down to very low levels of residual basal area so that you are not stuck with repeated thinnings. Going to a much better site. Uh, we discover that the site quality matters, and uh, we've heard about the presence of shade-tolerant shade species. John Tappener talked about hemlock. Uh, we have to deal with hemlock because it regenerates in its own shade, and uh, it tends to dominate an understory that has less shrubs in there. So after thinning, you wind up with a, a tremendous uh, uh, influx of hemlock. Well, here we have the same decrease in overstory basal area that came with thinning. We only had three different levels here. And uh, uh, they're moving back towards a stand, a cover that will exclude Douglas fir. And indeed, uh, it hasn't killed the Douglas fir, but the Douglas fir is not doing well. And after 10 years, uh, very few of them are two, two meters tall. And that is primarily in gaps. This is the dominant feature of that community. This is hemlock. There may be 20,000 hemlock to the acre or more in a lot of this uh, area. And uh, uh, that is not a good place to recruit anything. It 
totally excludes Douglas fir if the Douglas fir wasn't there first. We have some studies going in southeast Alaska that uh, uh, was a spruce hemlock community where we've actually looked at these densities and we've done some pre-commercially thinning, pre-commercial thinning. Um, one of the things that you will notice here is that they're in a, in a stand with roughly 10,000 hemlock to the acre uh, after logging. It has not been thinned. Uh, we've basically lost our understory there. And uh, so we've, we have uh, tracked the understory forage values and plant community diversity. And uh, it's a, uh, uh, quite a striking what happens when you let daylight into the swamp. Uh, this is a photo taken 13 years after our widest spacing. And uh, very interesting, we wind up with uh, persisting this long. We had a bunch of herbs uh, right away. Uh, now we have primarily uh, some shade tolerant shrubs here, uh, blackberry, blueberries. And, uh, but uh, we have this invasion of hemlock again. And that will rule a roost. It is much more capable of occupying that space than any of the smaller things uh, that, that came through the harvest. So here looking at the abundance of the herbs, uh, we've got uh, at the time of thinning, which was only 18 years old, uh, we had, uh, uh, we still had some herbs in the stand at the time of thinning. Uh, the thinning produced a flush that peaked about five years later and we were thinning down to some fairly radical levels. We spruce, spruce and hemlock stands, so we went down to 100 trees per acre, 250 per hectare, and our highest residual density was 300 trees per acre, or 750 per hectare, and the abundance of forbs was about the same for all of those densities. Any light coming into the stand was useful. They came up, and then as that stand developed, they crashed, and uh, they hadn't got down to where the unthinned were after 10 years, but they're, they're approaching that uh, quickly. And Liz Cole, who's managing our, our posters out, out here, uh, has, uh, she was the one who did all of these measurements here, and you can engage her if you wish about the future of uh, understories in these thin stands. It's not very good primarily because of reinvasion of conifers. So if we thin down to low levels, uh, we have another problem, and that is we wind up with uh, a potential blowdown, serious blowdown, in which the, all of the nice things we've set up is not going to work out very well. So we do have, have to deal with the reality that thinning will just get a temporary flush of undergrowth, and uh, so we want to lead to uh, something that gives a more permanent sequence of events that will keep D Douglas fir in the, uh, in the pattern. And let's look at uh, a comparative analysis of long rotation even age management uh, with wide spacing as a way of meeting all of the objectives. This is a six year old clear cut that was planted with Douglas fir at about a 15 by spacing a very, very rich community of herbs and shrubs, and uh, it's growing ra rapidly, and almost all the intolerant species are here. Douglas fir is going to da stay dominant for a long time. By the time it's 20 years old, Douglas fir is the dominant species, but everything else has pretty much crashed, and uh, so maybe a, a thinning before we get to this point is appropriate. Uh, commercial thinning now for small logs is uh, readily feasible. And this is a stage that is uh, pretty persistent. And so for until stands are about 40 years old, uh, give or take a little, uh, we can get commercial thinnings out. We can maintain some understories. We still probably can't recruit Douglas fir, but we can bring in a lot of understory uh, diversity. Eventually, we'll wind up with patches of even age stands. Uh, 
and uh, the, we'll need for a diverse uh, habitat, we'll need some very large patches, large, large clear cuts and, some, and a bunch of small ones uh, to deal with species with various size home ranges with continuity of habitat. Uh, it's, it becomes a very diverse landscape, although individual stands may not be as diverse as those that have been then heavily. Now these, in order to deal with a long rotation, we will, do have, we will have to thin. We'll have to thin repeatedly over the first, say, 70 or 80 years of, of a rotation, and that will maintain a lot of the understory stuff, but it will not maintain the Douglas fir. So eventually you come to the last stage, which one maintains perhaps for 90 to 150 years or 160 years. And this is where the emphasis is on the, on the structure in the upper crowns. The late, the late serial structure of that stand, you'll have a lot of understory structure with hardwoods or with shade tolerant conifers, but this is a very important part and you have to have a rotation so that this, this stage persists for long enough so that you have a full expression of the old growth characteristics of the stand. They won't be old growth, they'll be managed stands, but they'll have what the wildlife species presumably adapt to. So I uh, wrap this up with the idea that long rotations with all age classes present somewhere nearby all the time uh, will, will let us maintain the forest type and all the habitats that uh, we're, we're charged with preserving. It has worked before and it has worked again, but the long rotation is a dimension that will have a tendency to preserve the older stand features for longer. So a brief summary here is that the dominant position is important for shade intolerant species, including Douglas fir, and also for conditioning the understory. Periodic thinning favors mostly the shade tolerance understories including herbs, and the thinning will tend to promote a longer term maintenance of that layer. Treatment before harvest may take out uh, certain groups of plants so as to uh, permit uh, recruitment of shade intolerant and tolerant species together in the understory until the next thinning. The Douglas fir type probably needs large scale openings created by stand replacement events. Uh, doing that on purpose is probably more likely to bring it on time than waiting for a fire, a natural fire. And finally, just timely stand replacements, long cycles uh, are probably a, a less energy consumptive and more cost effective way of maintaining a range of species habitats uh, than we've been able to observe in the trends so far in the short terms that we have been working with the density management study. And I'll take questions if there's, if there's a moment. Hi, my name is Lisa Renan, um, BLM, Wildlife Catalyst. I'm wondering if you think some of your objectives that were uh, met with your spring could be accomplished with fire. The, the comment that uh, some of those objectives could be managed with fire, uh, that's a very good point. The persistence of the effects of a fire uh, probably is sh uh, of certain features will be shorter and cert certain features will be longer. It'll take out, the fire will take out understory conifers that you've already got established, uh, whereas the spraying will not. Uh, you can adjust the recipe for spraying so that you can take or leave almost any composition uh, that you may want to enhance or de deplete. So uh, there's lots and lots of tools in that kit that are being used uh, elaborately and eloquently uh, on private lands now to create uh, very desirable plant com communities. 